Following total atomic annihilation, the rebuilding of this great nation of ours may fall to you. That's why we here at Vault Boys WV will take you on an oral tour of the beautiful state of West Virginia. There's no other place to be better prepared for the impending fallout. Now we go live to our team of experts. Hello, and welcome to episode 8 of Vault Boys WV. If you didn't know, this is a weekly podcast bridging the gap between Fallout 76 and West Virginia through history, culture, and personal experiences. Some of it has references, and the rest is just our local take. From Holler to Highway, we've got you covered Six Ways Sunday. I'm your resident Appalachian scribe, Dave Chaffins, and joining me in a very special edition of this podcast, I've brought my favorite ecologist, forester, and all-around great gal, my wife, Selena. Hello. I like that air horn. That was oh, nice. Thank you. Thank I felt I needed to like cover my ears a little bit. Gotta get everyone hype. Are you the DJ of the day? I'm just the hype man. I'm just the hype man. I like a hype man. Everyone needs a hype man. <laughs> How you doing? You doing all right, Selena? I'm doing off I'm doing all right, yeah. Yeah. We just had a nice little dinner. Yeah. Cooked up myself, a little chicken tikka and rice. Mm-mm-mm. Tastes real good. So good. Stick to your ribs kind of meal, as my mother would say. Very delicious. Follow the recipe on the can. Extra delicious because I didn't have to cook it. There you go. That's what she gets for being on the podcast with me is the cooked meal. Is the cooked meal. Right. Maybe we should do this more regularly. Oh. You try you trying to you trying to fish for something? Try to fish for some dinners? Uh, just well, bargaining, you know. Oh, well, I can do I can I can follow directions. <laughs> I can follow directions when it comes to cooking. It's just you know, it gets a little higgle piggle in there sometimes, and then uh, I forget things, and stuff gets burned, and then <laughs> and then we get break. Chinese takeout, and then I break a glass, and then I forget to vacuum it, and then you get glass in your foot, and yeah. <laughs> all real experiences, true experiences. So we have a little bit of background in Appalachia, not just for the fact that we live in West Virginia, but also because when we were in college, right after we first started dating, we took Appalachian studies together. We sure did. And if anyone is a newly dating couple, some things that are a little bit strenuous on a relationship is taking a class together, puts a little bit of competition in there. Uh, We came out on the other side, though. We we did come out on the other side. Uh, I think... That you reveled in every single essay, because I think we had to write like an essay a week or every two weeks or something like that. It was one of those classes. Um, And all of your essays got like like low A's, and then all of mine were like high C's. Yep. And I didn't understand what I was doing, and you would always point out this and that, and then I would get mad and be like, well, I think mine's good, and you know, have it out, but... We had taken that, and then we had taken urban planning before that as well. And you kicked my butt in that class, too. Yeah, I some did. say Some would say you're the brains of this operation. Some would, but you are our public front, <laughs> uh, Mr. I'm the shaking County Man. Oh, my gosh. I just, I just write up notes. That's all I do. <laughs> so I, just, I, just, I, I write up the notes, and then I try to recall some of these experiences of the classes that I got C's in. Until I was a senior and taking it really seriously, in which I'll have you know that I got Dean's List twice in a row. Well, I got them in a row. Two times. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit uh, educated on some of these subjects. Edumacated? I'm, I'm a little bit edumacated. So what have you been doing fun this week, Selena? This week I have been working. I have been working out, playing with my dogs. We mm-hmm. are going through some flea troubles right now, mm-hmm. but we got the home spray and the topical and the combs and the shampoos, and we're getting these boys all settled. Yeah. I think one of the things we've been working on here this summer has been gardening. Oh, yeah. And it's very interesting coming from, we're both from, you're originally from Blacksburg and I'm mm-hmm. originally from Bluefield, which are m- a higher elevation actually than Charleston. And while we're down on the river, down on the, the Kanawha River, it's not the Kanawha, it is the Kanawha, Kanawha. like, like Lowell, Kanawha. And as we're down there in the river, we get more tropical weeds and plants yeah. It's like a constant battle of vines back there. Right. So there's like the three kinds of vines, 
plus our morning glories that we have. Yeah. And then the random little succulents. Yeah. We, in, our, in like all of our concrete pavers, we get these like succulents that grow and grow and grow. And I've never, before moving here, I've never even dealt with any of that because mm. you know, I, I lived on a hill for all my life and you mm-hmm. lived up on a hill too. Um, yeah. So... So now we've got succulents and vines and lizards. We have more lizards in our yard than I've even, like, even in Florida. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's because we're near a river, but I've also never seen a snake in our yard. Not that our yard is particularly big. We're going to knock anything. on wood, get some ASMR or whatever. <laughs> no snakes in the yard. <laughs> That's good. So you've followed me to West Virginia and have kind of been experiencing this the state from uh, the very first time, whereas I kind of lived adjacent to it in Bluefield and was able to grow up in this atmosphere. So what are some of your takes on West Virginia now living in it? Well, moving here, I was very um, surprised to find out how closely knit of a community it is. Everyone from here um, takes a whole lot of pride in being West Virginian and their roots, and it becomes really a true part of their identity Um, Besides maybe Texas, I've never met anybody from any other state that feels as much pride as they do from here. And it's um, one of the first things anyone from here will ask you is, where are you from? And Whose are you? Yeah, whose are you? Um, Depending on, like where you're from in the state, you might have a little bit of a different accent. And so people um, will ask me sometimes, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, actually, I'm from Virginia. And they're like, oh, I know. I can tell by your accent. And it's funny because you never really think of yourself as having right. a particular we had the, we had accent. We had this conversation the other day, and then I was like, you know, I haven't had anybody ask me that. And then you went to inform me that I have an accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depending on who you're talking to. Right. So, you know, for, if, if, I'm, if I'm out down in Boone County or something, I probably sound like a real city, city slicker, but, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> T- take, take the fish out of the little pond, put them in the ocean, and it's a little bit different story. <laughs> yeah. But everyone here really takes pride in taking care of their own. And now that mm-hmm. we've lived here um, for a few years, we've kind of made good impressions on people and are getting brought into that circle, which is a really nice feeling. Um, it was a little hard at first to get kind of your foot in the door, but now, um, we're taken care of just the same as anybody else. There's a whole lot of community feelings and, uh, watching out for your neighbor, which is, which I like a lot. Yeah. Everybody's really, uh, has treated us like, I mean, on our street, like family, and in that and return, at work and yeah, at work. I mean, we've had, we've everybody's been very supportive that we've we've been through and talked to, and it's it's unusual, I think, uh, uh, as compared to the norms when you go to a lot of the different communities in in the world. And yeah. I think this this is Virginia, West Virginia is just a very special place when it comes to once you're in, you're in. Yes, uh, for uh, sure. The community. So let's give me a little bit of background on. I know you don't play. A lot of video games. The video games are more kind of like a, a, th- a thing that I'm doing. But you like to play some video games. Some video games. I'm very selective. So tell me a little bit about your, your a little bit of history, a little bit of stuff you like. So my first foray into video games came, and I don't remember how old we were, but my brother and I got an old style plug and play, like with the joystick and one button that had Pac-Man and... Galaxians and Dig Dug on it. And so we would take turns playing that. All four members of my family, we'd pass it, pass it around and everyone would take a turn and everyone had their favorites. I re- was really into Pac-Man and we had a lot of fun with that. And then maybe a year or so later, we got the Sega Genesis All-Star plug and play. Oh, oh yeah. It not had Alex Kidd and Echo the Dolphin and... Um, like a little racing game. And when, I, when I would play Echo the Dolphin, I would always, I always thought that the sound he made when he got hurt was really mm-hmm. sad and always made me feel sad. Yeah, oh, it did. <laughs> I really liked Alex Kid. That mm-hmm. was fun. But that, I mean, very much like the old Mario's. And so that's all we had for a long time. And then one year for Christmas, my brother and I got from Santa a GameCube 
And everyone loves to tell the story that when we opened it, I said, we don't have to be stupid nerds with our plug and plays anymore. And so my, like <laughs> that's Selena telling it like it is. Oh yeah. And so we had like Mario Kart double dash and mm. super smash brothers. So those were the first like mainstream modern day video games that ever I ever played. And eventually we got a Wii and we played a lot of just dance. I know you and I, Played that a little bit in college. Yeah, we would we convince you, you to bit. take a turn. Well, I think I think you were impressed because it was like maybe within like the first like few weeks of us uh, started dating, and I think two of your roommates or sweet mates or something that you were with had guys that they were interested in and over, and they were too cool. Oh to, yeah, they to did even, not want to play to even do like a just dance. And I was like, well, they're being kind of not so lock. So I was the fun one, and it was the one that was being stupid and trying to do the exact little dances that oh, they yeah. did. Oh, yeah, getting real having, into it. Having fun. And I think that played out in my favor. I think it did. And so then in college, we played, like, everyone would take turns playing Grand Theft Auto, and I was horrendous at it. And We played a lot of Sega All-Stars Racing. And I'm good at that. I know you are. The racing games I'm good at. It mm-hmm. started with this game on the GameCube called Wave Race, which I thought was just the greatest game ever. And then we had this one friend who came over. Who right, had, don't we? We own that. And then oh, I, think, I brought it with us. Yeah, and we 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 plugged it in, and then you just like killed me at it. I ever killed since. you, yeah, because I'm great at racing games. But this guy who was we were family friends with was like, Wave Race. That's a terrible game. I can't believe you're playing that. And so, I mean, that was just one of the three games that we owned. So I didn't know any different, but I loved it. And so then we got Mario Kart and I got real good at that. And Mm. so I was pretty good at the Sega or the Sonic All-Stars Racing. Mm. Well, when we got got Mario Kart, um, I got it on... I think it was when wedding stuff was going on. Mm-hmm. And then I played it up in a weekend and then you were mad. Because you learned all the levels. Right. And so I was like 100% better than you. And then you, it was like, I was beating you at every turn. And then I, I put it down for like two weeks. And then I forgot it all. And then... Now we're very evenly now matched. it's Now it's anybody's game. Yeah. Which is more fun. It is more fun. But I am good at games that are for children. Yes. But not for grown-ups. Like, one time after you had already left school, um, I was hanging out with our good friends and podcast listener, Cody, and um, his roommate, Alex, and then my two best friends from college, Charlotte and Suzanne, and they were like, okay, okay, we're going to have a drinking game. And so you girls have to play Star Wars Battlefront, and we'll take a shot after every person you kill. And they got bored of that pretty quick because between the three of us, I don't even think we killed one single person in that game. We were all horrible. So it was more it was more like a a casual drinking game for them. Like, you know, just a casual drinking game with no drinking. No drinking. (laughs) (laughs) We had a good time. (laughs) Well, that's fun. So you don't I, I know that you don't know a lot about Fallout. You like to see me play it it's fun to watch and you yeah. like the soundtrack and, oh the soundtrack is great and the, di- the different locations and you like games that, that there's exploring in. so yeah. like you like zelda a lot yeah and i can help you out sometimes playing yeah. the zelda. i play zelda and then at any of like the boss levels david has to help me but right. it's pretty fun and then when it's um, when it gets a little high octane like when it gets a little, yeah that's too much it gets a little higgle piggle you gotta help yeah but um Elder Scrolls and Uncharted mm-hmm. and she likes to call all of the Elder Scrolls Morrowind. Morrowind, even though so I play I, I played Elder Scrolls Online and Skyrim and she saw the ad for Morrowind Morrowind on Snapchat where it, it turns you into like a a bear a bear <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm at work one day and I just get the Snapchat that's, that's <laughs> Selena and she roars and she morphs into a bear and I was like oh my yeah. So now all of those are called more wind, but so I I know that you're, you're you don't know Fallout other than just seeing me play it. But I thought you would think it's interesting that it's being based in an area that you know fairly well now. Yeah, it's super cool, and I'm excited for when you play it and we get to see really what the whole scope is. I know we know bits and pieces from um, online teasers and documentaries and. 
media outlets like that, but it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see what the scope of it is. Like we live downtown kind of, and so it'll be neat to see if maybe you could build your base like around where our house is or something yeah. like that. I think that would be pretty cool. I tweeted that out to the thought account and then people were like, how do you know which house is yours? Like, how would you know if you're down there? And uh, if you go in, if you, you're familiar at all with the East end of Charleston, there's only like four or five designs. Yeah. <laughs> there was like a few architects that right. came in. Ours was built in 1920. Um, so you can, it's interesting. You can pick out which ones are in our era. So I, I, I'm holding out that at least they have one that looks like it in that general area. Yeah. But if they don't, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll make one that looks just <laughs> like it. So with that, we'll go into our next segment. So, Selena, fortunately for you, you don't have to talk very much, if not at all, about Fallout 76 news because there wasn't that that much this week. Although next week, I believe that there's a big article being published by, I believe it's GameSpot that we'll cover on here. Uh, I don't think you'll be on that particular episode. We'll refer back to our gaming experts. We will refer back to the gaming experts on uh, on this particular thing. So, with that being said... There's not a lot of Fallout 76 news that we're going to cover. We are, however, going to cover a little bit of Fallout 76 lore and West Virginia history and ecology, forestry, all that fun natural science stuff. Oh, that's my jam. I know that's your jam. That's why I have you on here. So we're going to talk about the area in Fallout 76 called the Cranberry Bog, which is one of the six distinctive areas in Fallout 76. It is based on the Cranberry Glades in West Virginia. So essentially, they have taken the Cranberry Glades, which are rather small in in, in comparison. Like it does not, the Cranberry Glades do not take up one sixth of the state of West Virginia, but they've expanded them for Fallout 76. But we're going to talk about our recent trip to the Cranberry Glades and a little bit about your experience, what I've studied in college as well. So we'll give you a little bit of background on the Cranberry Glades. So I'll read out a few little facts here. How's that sound? Sounds good. I have some facts as well, so I might oh, pop on in there. You have some facts? I okay, some well, facts. I'll give you some room here. Okay. So the Cranberry Glades are a cluster of boreal-type bogs in the Monongalia Forest, or Monongahela, as people like to say. It's one of the few high elevation bogs in the United States at 3,400 feet above sea level. So this area was designated as a national landmark in 1974. The whole area that's protected is 750 acres, and it is the largest bog in the state of West Virginia. Wow, look at you. I'm looking over at your paper now, and I see you have a bunch of notes. It's like a college textbook over there. You've got all kinds of stuff. When I'm, I'm led impressed. in with the title of ecologist, you got to... I'll have to cook you dinner more often. got to step it up. <laughs> so the, the bog is the source of the Cranberry River, which feeds the Gully River, which is a popular whitewater rafting area. Like the New River and the Gully River are kind of the big names when it comes to whitewater rafting in the state. The interesting thing about these glades is that they're a remnant of the last ice age. So as the glaciers receded as they were pulling back after the last ice age, some plants and animals that had been displaced were able to survive in these higher elevations that they were used to this temperature. So the higher elevations provided these similar conditions, like I I think it was the northern taiga and tundra. Yes, so this is the southernmost point in the United States where many of the species that are there are found in our whole country. So... The plants that have grown into the ground are grown on this prehistoric peat, which peat, if you don't know, is an accumulation of partially decayed vegetation that has a spongy, sand-like texture. So this is a huge carbon sink. And so the plants that are there absorb carbon dioxide that's released from the decaying peat. And one of the main species that does that is called sphagnum moss. And we'll get to hear a little bit about that in just a couple minutes. Oh my goodness, look at you go. Okay, so the two main plants that... As far as what Fallout 76 is mentioned in the no-clip documentary, um, they are flesh-eating plants, which 
In Fallout 76, that's, of course, you know, something that seems like it would fit in. Oh, yeah. But there are also flesh-eating plants themselves in the cranberry box, mm-hmm. which makes it very interesting. So I've got, I've got two flesh-eating plants here that we'll talk a little bit about. So the first one, and the one we saw on the trip, was the purple pitcher plant. Also known as turtle socks or the side saddle flower. Oh my good turtle socks. Turtle socks. <laughs> turtle. Turtle. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. This plant, <laughs> this plant, this plant's flowers form an open rosette of green leaves that are often tinged purple. They bloom in the spring and have maroon petals. The plants are most famous for their hollow gibbous leaves that look like uh, pitchers, like a purple pitcher plant. These pitchers catch rainwater where they trap insects with stiff, downward pointing hairs. They release digestive enzymes into the rainwater captured in their pitcher that slowly eat away at the trapped insect. Evidence does show that the purple pitcher plant have less than a 1% success rate of catching insects. That's pretty sad. Well, you know, it's just it's just a little rainwater in there and so it doesn't it doesn't seem like that there's a lot stopping them. And so that I mean if you look at it when if you see them out in the wild, they're pretty it's a pretty big area for an insect to to, to get out of. I was surprised at at those pitcher plants because like what you picture one as looks very different than this particular species Mm -hmm. at least in my opinion i was picturing more like what the corpse flower looks like or like you always picture Mm -hmm. it being much more dramatic or like a long like you'd see in like the amazon rainforest like gigantic and those are pitcher plants but this is just a very small variety i would say that the like little pitcher part was maybe two inches tall Mm -hmm. um pretty little and was it looked like mostly like an orchid yeah, with I a little say, bit bigger. Yeah, bulb. it looked kind of like an orchid, and yeah. it's interesting because in uh, it was mentioned in the documentary that uh, I believe that these plants are more like a hive in Fallout seventy six. Mm. So you know, orchids are a, a series underground, like they're all connected together. What right? Is that right? Not necessarily. No, orchids usually grow up in trees. Like well, they maybe, don't grow in the dirt. Mm, maybe I'm thinking of something different. Anyways. It's it's interesting because in in Fallout seventy six they're gonna have a hive mind right essentially that's pretty cool so those are not native interestingly enough they, so they are invasive well they are not native to this area right um, they were brought there by the um, moving like ice. That was there, and so it travel. It like drug the seeds down and deposited them, and so that's why they are there, which is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. The other um, carnivorous plant that's there is native, though, mm-hmm. which I have out here as the round leaved sundew. And so there are 194 species of sundew, and so this is just one of them that's right. there. I looked it up, and it was like the uh, the most common. Yes, sundew. Yeah. So this small plant spreads long red hairs that secrete a gluey, sugary substance. Also called mucilaginum. Oh, my. So this this substance attracts insects to feed on it. Once the insect is trapped in that really sticky sundew substance that it has, uh, it secretes enzymes that then dissolve the insect slowly. So it does that because the soil in the peat bogs typically isn't very good because that's sphagnum moss Mm. takes up all the nutrients. And so the sundew needs to be able to get the nutrients it needs to grow from somewhere else. And so they um, attract the the insects and we don't have a a number of how effective they are, but I mean, I'm the statistics are not there. Statistics (laughs) are not available on the effectiveness of the sundew, but I, believe that they were pro- are probably much more successful than 1% as they are really relying on those insects for um, their nutrition and to be able to grow. Um, they're pretty interesting, actually. They have medicinal uses for many, many years. They've been used um, in teas or in capsules to cure bronchitis, whooping cough, or tuberculosis. Mm. And currently they are in... Um, they're being used for tissue engineering because they have these nanoparticles in that sugary substance that they have. And 
the substance, once it's dried, um, that substrate is being used to coat implants that people are using, like artificial hips and knees. They put a coating of this mucus on there um, that encourages tissue growth and it decreases the risk of rejection of those implants. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. That's really interesting. They're really this little tiny plant. We didn't even we think didn't. we saw them. I, I think we did because they're very small, did, but. but we didn't notice them in particular, but they mm. get their name because the light shining on the little puddles of substrate looks like dew that's interesting so this area the the cranberry glades themselves um are are a protected area and in college we had a essentially it was like a four thousand level senior level class that they only gave like once every four semesters and they just grabbed everybody who was in the the minor for Appalachian studies that hadn't taken it, which was like, I think like 11 or 12 people for our, for our class. And we're essentially going through, I think two books. Um, one specifically about protecting West Virginia's highlands. And so uh, the, the book and, and I, I I think it's called Protecting the Highlands. I think that's the exact name of it. Do we still own that? I think I still have that. Yeah, in we there. still have it. It's on the shelf. Oh uh, yeah. Um, so I could I could always pull it out for reference, but I think that one's a little, it's a little thick uh, <laughs> to pull anything quick. But it essentially covers how the East Coast of the United States didn't have a lot of protected areas coming out of where on the West coast you had more involvement from the Sierra club. And so it was more about how the Appalachian area was trying to figure out how to protect areas that they thought were vital. And so everybody in the class was assigned a particular protected area to study and to present on, on why it needs to be protected. And so the one that I got for the class was the Cranberry Glades, which I had absolutely no idea what the Cranberry Glades were, and I thought it was like, okay, so it's like Cranberry Farm, like, you know, on the Cranberry Juice commercials with the guys that get out there in the little fishing waders, and they, you know, what is that? Not Hillshire Farm. Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray, yeah, you know, you got the old guy and the, you know, kind of kooky younger guy. I thought that's what it was going to be like. And yeah, so I did be, too. So it's kind of going to be like a swamp filled with, these cranberries kind of hanging around the the yard and, you know, swimming out there and I'd have to get on my waders. But it was incredibly interesting seeing these pictures of this, like, red field. And this was the first pictures I saw of it. It was, like, completely red. And I'm sure it was taken in the autumn. Um, but I was like, well, that's kind of that's kind of a weird little area. And then I learned about these carnivorous plants and how... They wanted to show off a portion of the botanical area that they had, but they didn't want to essentially mess with anything that they had going on there. And so they were trying to figure out ways that they could draw people to it without harming that. Because if you if you're familiar with peat or anything swamp-like, you don't want to actually step. It's in. very spongy. Right. Um, so they built these this boardwalk that travels around a portion of it and yeah. i and i had never been i had even during college when i was studying it i did a bunch of different stuff but i never had a chance to go out there yeah so it's a half mile boardwalk that is just a simple loop and it walks through two of the nine uh it's either six or nine bogs in the in the system there and it's it says on the website wheelchair accessible. I would disagree because parts of it were submerged under water. Yeah, um, it was not wheelchair accessible. But yeah. it's a wooden boardwalk that goes the whole time. It's um, not a strenuous walk at all. Um, mm-hmm. so we ended up, me and you, uh, just we we had this idea that we should do, go on more more adventures in the state. This is even before we st- I started doing this podcast. We were like, we need to explore backyard a little bit more and so uh, we had made plans and I wanted to go there because I did essentially six months of research that I wish I could remember every single detail and then I could be very educated on the on the cranberry glades but 
we ended up saying, okay, we're going to go out there and we're going to go like, you know, to do like a hiking, a little bit of hiking in the morning mm-hmm. and go out to the Cranberry Glades. Yeah. So we took a scene, the scenic route out there. We drove over the New River Gorge, which mm-hmm. has been talked about on the pod. Recurring, um, recurring theme. Recurring theme. We passed, um, by Summersville Lake, which is another landmark in our state. And, and so that's like our end goal. Like, you know, when we're, when we're rich and famous and, and retired, old, yeah, we get a little lake house on Summersville Lake. And we just like, you know, have a boat. Yeah. Hang out. I'll pick up fishing. We can make pods all the time. <laughs> Podcast for everybody. <laughs> um, but we drove up there into the forest and it was really beautiful. That first, um, oh gosh, yeah. the first steps out onto the loop was incredibly beautiful. That you could look out and see the mountains and see that that field with that was full of the pitcher plants mm-hmm. and little cranberry plants, which I had never seen before. They looked different than mm-hmm. I thought that they would. And it was lovely. And so then like you kind of turn a corner and then you're pretty much closed in by this little boreal forest. And, um, there was beautiful, clear, clear water running through it and uh, yeah. little minnows. Um, I was hoping we'd get to see more wildlife, birds or mm-hmm. something. Um, but That was one of the things that, uh, and one of the details that I particularly remember because it, it, it's so fun, is that with the, the glaciers and their wildlife that they had brought in and then the, when they were seeding, a lot of the West Virginian um, flying squirrels that you would see are said to have originated from that area. And so we were hoping for flying squirrels. I was hoping and you know, it gets displaced over time, but I was like praying that I could see a flying squirrel and I not just see one out in the wild doing whatever. See it fly. Like do the whole like spread its wings. But I think they're very rare. I think so too. It's like over at the Capitol complex. The elusive black squirrel. The elusive black squirrel. So if you go over to the West Virginia Capitol complex, you have all the gray squirrels, right? And all the gray squirrels, you know, it's neighborhood squirrels, you see them. But then there's sometimes one black sleek squirrel and the black squirrels like like david just said they are so 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 sleek they look completely different they look like they're made of beautiful silk yeah they do and they're a little bit smaller yeah i'd say say, but we have only seen them at the complex i've i've never seen one here no i'm pretty sure they're living in the uh, the squirrels are living in the posts of our house and they they're gray power lines (laughs) and they're all gray and we live close to the capital and even i guess that that big street that circles the capital is enough to create some sort of an ecological barrier for them, and they just stay there. But um, they're very elusive, mm-hmm. as are the flying the squirrels. The flying squirrels, right? So I, I, I was, I was hoping that we would be able to be able to see them. Yeah. But the, the when we got out there, that first that first area, like you said, was, oh, was, was so fantastic, beautiful. and you. Normally, when you're in the mountains of West Virginia, you're doing a hike, you have trees around you. And, and you're so very closed in, even by the mountains themselves. You're right. kind of locked in. And so it's an incredible perspective because there are no trees in that swamp. There's trees ar- ar- around it, essentially, in the bog. Excuse me, it's not a swamp. Um, there's trees around it, but you can see out all the way to the base of the mountain where the trees start and go up. So you can see, I mean, a, a, set, a set of the Appalachian Mountains from, like, the ground floor with no obstruction to your view. Like it's, it's yeah. really beautiful to look at and see. And the, when we were going, there were a lot of photographers in that first area that were set up their tripods mm-hmm. and taking pictures or whatever. Yeah. But the whole, I don't necessarily want to call it a trail. The half mile boardwalk was, um, very family friendly. There were periodically um, waysides with information on the mm-hmm. minnows and on the some of the plants, um, all geared towards a young audience. So, if anyone interest is interested in going, it's a wonderful place to bring kids. Mm-hmm. We um, synced it up with our trip to the Greenbrier, which you've heard about, and we did a little waterfall hike that day too. Yeah, the f- Falls of Hills Creek. Yes. Um, was 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 the name, and that's like maybe a half mile up the road from. Yeah, it was very close. Yeah, and it was a short hike. It was maybe like it was mostly stairs. So uh, it was easy going down. Oh my gosh! But then but coming back, up. how many? It was like four hundred something. We counted four hundred stairs. Yeah, that was a lot. You had your Fitbit on. It was counting them. I counted them out loud. 
I don't know. It was it was quite something. We were ready for lunch. Yeah, we were. We, oh, by then. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. But the the boardwalk itself is not, is is very easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it is depending on the weather, depending on the season. There are parts of it that are a little sunken, so. Yep. Plan to get your shoes wet or to try to... Uh, Do a little mini hop over the wet parts. Right. But it was very well maintained. It was. It was a really nice place. Mm-hmm. So with with that, that kind of covers a little bit of the Cranberry Bog portion that's going to be in, in Fallout. I'm excited to see what they do. Um, if it's going to be like a lot of the pictures online where it's more, you know, that kind of like deep red in the autumn, which we didn't go. We went in the summer, which probably the autumn is the best time to go, you know. It Get was you... pinkish. It was pinkish, yeah. It was, but that first, I, my assumption is that it'll look pretty much all like that first main view, that like right. quintessential Cranberry Glades view. If you Google it, it's that picture. It's that picture. You're going to see it. It's iconic for that area. Yeah. But it was interesting to see the the um, pitcher plants we saw mm-hmm. a bunch of um i was excited for that to see them uh we didn't we didn't notice any sundew i'm sure there yeah, was some we should there. have looked more carefully but we didn't really know what it looked like yeah we were just trying to figure it out it was also one of the first trips that i brought my selfie stick with me uh, that was very helpful in taking <laughs> pictures uh, at a distance if you if you catch my drift but so that's kind of a little bit of an overview of the cranberry glades um So with that, we'll move on to our next segment. So this week, uh, we have one of uh, the rotating segments that I haven't figured out another rotating portion for, but I bet you that next two weeks we'll have a different segment for this last piece. But for now, this is the Musician of the Week, which is Quiet. So we're a little bit familiar about that, but let me give you a little background. So I put... I. Pulled this directly from their website, which is a lot like an electronic press kit, which I've learned about recently. So, for those with eclectic music tastes, to those who can't taste anything, there is quiet. Unclassifiable as a musical act, quiet defies the bounds of traditional music, taking from every culture on the planet and orchestrating the sound, feel, and spirit into a high energy pop package. It is as fun as it is unique with its blend of rock, jazz, gypsy, funk, and beyond. Notorious for moving even the most stoic to dance, Quiet's chemistry resonates with the audience to create an experience for you to remember, as well as a whole new perspective on musical performance. So Quiet is a very popular Charleston-based band that was one of the first bands that we were exposed to when we moved here. Yeah, so we went to this concert series that's called Sound Checks. It's at the Clay Center, which is a neighborhood music venue and science museum. And we saw Quiet and a couple other bands, The See mm-hmm. the Sea, and um, I don't remember what other acts were there. I think but, it was just The See the Sea and Quiet. But that. Quiet made a big impression on, the, on us. So it was for their album release, yes. uh, Kiss from the Universe. I think it's out. You can listen to it on Spotify or where you normally get music. Um, and it was like their first full original. Full length album. And so we hadn't heard them before, but our f- good friend Joe loves that band. And he was like, guys, you've got to come to this concert. Mm-hmm. So we had a really good dinner downtown first and then walked over to the Clay Center. And um, it was a really cool concert. We had to go in the back door to the venue, which we were a little bit confused, confused about. about. Yeah, we but, felt like we are kind of going somewhere we weren't supposed to. Yeah, but we actually went to the front door, and right. one of the employees was like, oh, no, you have to go to the back door. So <laughs> there was a little bit of a snaggle there, but the concert actually took place all on the stage, and so the guests and the musicians were all on one level on the stage together, which created a really neat, like concert going atmosphere and it wasn't like small by any means. There was a big crowd. It was packed. Yeah. And and it was, it was done with the stage at the clay center is big because they have like orchestra performances and they have the pit down there. And so everybody was kind of piled into that pit area with them on their like small stage. Right. And they, but I mean the, the way that they were playing and interacting with people, it felt like, I mean, there was no separation. Yeah, like the energy was 
so high and we were incredibly impressed. So we bought some merch and got the CD Mm -hmm. and um, then kind of followed them around a little bit. They play a lot of shows around. And so we have a summer concert series here in Charleston called Live at the Mm Levee. So we walked our dogs down there one time and saw them and they played um, Halloween in our neighborhood. Yeah, that was fun. That was a blast. Um, So they like reliably play such a fun, good show. It during the time when we were seeing them most frequently, it was a lot of the same songs, but every time it was, it was a hit and the energy in the crowd was so huge. And they really sound a lot like, um, this band, the squirrel nut zippers, I think, but Mm -hmm. they're really, I don't think it is anyone else making music like them right now. I, I really, as far as like bands that are of the acclaim that they are, I don't think anybody is. I don't, yeah, I, they're very unique, and everyone in that band is top notch talent. The musicians, the vocalists, it's a big old crew. And I know sometimes there's a little bit of rotation in who's playing with them, but they are all like great musicians, great vocalists. The lyrics are fun. Mm-hmm. And they're like the best way to see them. I think is to see them live. Yeah, the the, the energy and the, the live performances are great. Um, a, another note, just because we're saying it the, the correct way, quiet is spelled Q I E T. So there's no U in quiet. Because uh, what do they? What's their? I slogan? think I think it's um, because it's it's quiet without you or something like that or because without you. Yeah, it's something like that. It's but something. Essentially, yeah. it means that their audience is required for them to make right. music. Which I've I've ne- I've never seen I've never seen Quiet with a dull oh, audience. No. They it make is... and like they said in their bio, they make everyone dance. Old people, little cute babies, everyone is like dancing. Go and into town. It's, yeah, it's a it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, that's kind of the, the band that we're in, enjoying the most right now in, in Charleston itself. There's other bands that we're listening to and going to see, but that was kind of our first one, and so we have kind of a special connection to that. But as far as announcements or um, community stuff, uh, I'm going to save that probably for next week uh, when we have a, a, f- a full-length one. This will be a little short to, uh, this week just because we're, we're doing some moving and shaking here, shaking some things up. So for today, that's it. Don't forget to email us your questions at vaultboyswv at gmail.com and check us out on social media at vaultboyswv. And tell your friends. Make sure to rate and review us on iTunes, uh, Stitcher. Uh, If you rate and review us, I'm going to start calling out some names on there that I see. Leave a little comment. Give you a little shout out. Yeah, give you a little shout out. Have a little shout out moment. As Jonathan Van Ness likes to say, and we like to say together, your vegan moment or your... You know, fancy belt moment or what have you. Your skincare moment. Yeah, whatever moment. Delightful. Whatever moment you need. So for now, the vault door is closing. Stay safe. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Look at <laughs> You're upon it. I like it. I like Flip it. Flip on it. All right, I'll that. This is what you get.